So uh, in this session, oh, first of all, my name is Keith Pijanowski. I work for MinIO, and I do a lot of work on their AI, AI ML messaging. Uh, I'm, a, I'm basically an engineer on their marketing team, and I develop a lot of content that uh, shows how to use MinIO for um, artificial intelligence. So what I want to talk about today is how to build out a complete data infrastructure where you'll see that uh, storage is at the heart of it and how this can support all the workloads needed for uh, AI ML. And specifically the topics I want to cover, and I will tell you that I have, uh, I have 30 minutes to talk and I have 30 slides. So if, I, I still think we can have time for questions, but if uh, our questions run short, I'll be at the MinIO Min booth both today and tomorrow. What I want to talk about today is the concept of a data lake house and how it kind of changes how you think about object storage and how you can use object storage. And then the other bullets I want to talk about are how are the various workloads that you need to support if you're going to be doing everything AI. That's ML ops, traditional AI, generative AI, uh, distributed training. Uh, a lot of people overlook distributed training, but I think it's very important. And then finally, we're going to have a little bit of fun and I'm going to show you some statistics with uh, GPUs. Okay, so to start off with, what is, what is this thing we call a data lake house? And if you've been following the industry, you know that there's this concept of open table formats. Okay, and what they do is they allow you to use object storage to build a data warehouse, but it's a special data warehouse. It's a data warehouse that's OTF based, open table format based. So when we, when we, when we, but when we talk about a data lake house, what we're talking about is a storage platform where you have a data warehouse where you can issue SQL queries to get your structured data, but you also have a data lake where you can store your unstructured data. Okay, and collectively we call this a data lake house. It sounds like a marketing scheme. You know, these things have both existed in the past. So, are you just putting things together and giving it another name and calling it a new product? It's not that at all. Again, it's very important to understand that the data warehouse is OTF-based, and there's integration between these two. And you can understand, being from MinIO, why, why this is, is kind of exciting to us, because this elevates object storage to not just be used for a data lake, MinIO being an S3-compatible object store, but we, are now, we can now be the storage solution for your data warehouse, where you can do distributed SQL queries. Let's take a real quick look at the open table formats in the industry today. Uh, there, are, there are three of them, Apache Iceberg, Apache Hootie, and Delta Lake. Now, essentially, they are specifications. This is not software that you install, but their job is to create the metadata to specify what metadata you need such that objects in object storage can be grouped together into a concept of a table. And the data warehouse is created with this technology. Like I said, it's special. It, it's a lot better than uh, traditional data warehouses. You get things like schema evolution, okay? uh, partition evolution, acid transactions, time travel, and my favorite feature, uh, which I'll show you later in this talk, is uh, zero copy branching. Okay, the, the ability to use Git-like commands on your data. Okay, if you, if you were at the LakeFS session, which was next door, uh, they do something very similar, but they do it with unstructured data. What I'm talking about here is on the structured side of the data lake house. Uh, matter of fact, we did, we did some joint messaging with the LakeFS folks. If you, LakeFS folks, if you check our blog site, you'll see a couple of posts where we kind of uh, put our brains together on how you could use their technology with MinIO. But... To back to our message, uh, th this is just to give you a rough idea what this metadata looks like. Uh, this is the iceberg uh, architecture. And, and they, they all do similar things, but I think the iceberg one is conceptually easiest to understand. The very lowest layer is just your data. That's your, think, think, of, that, think of the lowest layer there as, as MinIO. And those would be um, structured data that you loaded through the open table format data warehouse, things, you know, structured data that's in a parquet file or an Avro file, okay? And then I won't go into the details, but the rest of it is the metadata needed to keep track of where data is for a specific table, okay? Uh, now, 
when, when you build this out, you have a lot of options. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is just some options you have to, to start off cheap so that you don't have to do a, a big bang replacement in your data warehouse. Since object storage is used for both the data warehouse and the data lake, there's, if you don't want to, if you want to just start out small, you can just have one installation of MinIO and just use buckets to separate the two types of storage. Okay? But at some point, you're going to grow, and you're going to have different workloads on the data lake side of your, of your storage solution and, and the data warehouse. So for that, it might be beneficial to have two separate tenants of MinIO so that you can support those different workloads and scale those out independently. Now, where things get really interesting is when we talk about the processing layer of uh, the, the uh, data lake, of the data, uh, the, the data warehouse. Okay, so another feature of an OTF-based data warehouse is that storage and compute are disaggregated. Okay, so think of MinIO as being the data warehouse storage, but you can, if you want, you can just have one global uh, processing engine on top of it, which processes your SQL commands and does the distributed SQL, and that, that could be used by everyone in your organization. But another option is to have a different processing engine for every department that is going to put a workload on this uh, data warehouse. And that's kind of interesting, and if you follow the news, you probably saw that Databricks bought a company known as Tabular, uh, which was started by the creator of Iceberg. And what their promise is, it looks like a it looks like this is going to be good news for the industry, but they promised to make the open table formats interoperable. So another dimension to the interoperability you get with this type of architecture is that in the future we could see processing engines where all processing engines support all table formats, and you could just pick the one you want, you pick the processing engine you want, you specify the table format you want, and it would, and it would just work. So that's, the, that's what I hope to see in the industry. Uh, we'll see if it happens. All right, when we, put, when we put all this together, it's going to look something like this. Now, this is, this is the result of a couple of white papers that we at MinIO authored. If you stop by our booth, you can get a hard copy. Uh, I don't have time to go through all these layers. Uh, that's another talk that I do. But what I have highlighted here in yellow are where are the workloads needed for AIML, which is what I want to focus on today. So uh, let's really quickly go through those. So let's talk about machine learning operations. So if you're not familiar with machine learning operations, real quick, it is to machine learning what DevOps is to traditional software development. And if you really think about it, when you develop a model, it's almost the exact opposite of developing traditional software. Your data, your data is always changing. Oops. Your, your data is constantly changing because you're doing different experiments. You want to um, keep track of every version of every model. And instead of coding all the time, you're running experiments. So for this reason, you really need different tools than what you'd use for traditional, uh, traditional uh, development. And I've done a lot of research on different MLOps tools. These are my 10 bullet points. Okay, I'm, um, but just at a, at a high level, what I want to say is that I think if you're going to pick an MLOps uh, tool, you re and these are in order of importance, in, in my opinion, and this is the opinionated portion of my talk, but I think you really need support from a major player. You want an ML MLOps tool that's supported by a major player because this space is changing a lot. And as a concrete example of that, a lot of the, the tools that I'm going to show you, they're right now kind of retooling and adding features for large language models, which are a little bit different than your, your traditional, uh, traditional AI. So again, these are my 10 features. Uh, what I want to do is kind of walk you through real quick uh, some of the major players and kind of talk about what their value add is, what, what they do really well. So the first one, and again, on our blog site, I've kind of covered all of these tools, and I'm going to, I'm going to present to you really quickly a Kubeflow, MLflow, and, and ML Run. So the best, the best way to describe Kubeflow is that they set out to democratize Kubernetes. So their real, their, their, their real big selling feature is this concept of serverless functions to build pipelines, and, and they do that really well. 
You could write a Python function, throw a decorator on it, and their platform just will take that function, install it in a container for you, and just run it. And you can also specify how you want your uh, pipeline to look like. They also have other features in case you want to take more control over the containers, like you may have additional modules you want in that container. And if you have containers that you've pre-built that were authored in languages other than Python, they even support that with um, custom containers. Okay? So again, Kubeflow, that's your tool if you're really a big Kubernetes shop. And they did a really good job of providing a runtime environment for your model training and your data pipelines. Uh, that can be a little bit hard to get your head around. Like when I was first learning it, I thought it was a little rough. Like, okay, you know, someone else is running my code and I got to you know, deploy it somewhere or, or I got to tell it where to, where to go. Uh, but once you get it up and running, uh, it, it works really well. And you even get a nice little visual of what your training pipelines, your data pipelines uh, look like. Next one is MLflow by Databricks. Their claim to fame is that they really wanted to drill into experiment tracking, which is probably the most important thing an ML Ops tool can do for you. And, and, they, and they did that well. They, um, and they also facilitate collaboration very well, and they give you nice graphs that show you how your different experiments are progressing, and, what, you, know, and you can compare different metrics across experiments. Uh, like I said, if you just need experiment tracking, uh, that's the tool for you. They, they don't do a whole much in terms of you know, giving you a, a runtime environment, but that's not what they set out to do. Um, and again, I, this is a really good tool. And the last one is a tool from a company known as Aguasio, an uh, Israeli-based company, which was recently bought out by McKinsey and Company. And their mission was to remove all boilerplate code. So once you come up to speed on ML Run and you have your you know, train, model training all set up, you're going to be pretty surprised at how little amount of code you have to run. They have a lot of decorators and baked-in tools that, will, that you just you know, pass parameters to, and it takes care of the training for you. And they even, use a, they even provide a serverless functions via a third-party tool that they've adopted called Nucleo. And they, they, they can also integrate with Kubeflow pipelines if that's your preferred tool. So they, you can mix and match between uh, those two tools. Okay. Good. That's, um, that's ML Ops. And, the, and again, the, let me just go back to ML Ops real quick. So the one thing I wanted to point out, too, is all three of these tools, uh, ML Run, ML Flow, Kubeflow, all of their under the hood when you deploy them to your production environment, they're all using MinIO for, the, for your unstructured storage. So as you run your experiments and you're tracking your experiments, you're going to, be want, you're going to want to checkpoint your models. You may want to version your training sets. They're sending all of that to uh, MinIO. And a lot, all of these tools have like some other third-party open source relational database for tracking metrics. Uh, they're going to install those uh, as well. And what would be nice is if in the future, uh, these three tools actually use the data warehouse for that structured data. So you'd have your metrics in your data warehouse and your, you know, your, your artifacts, which are your models and training sets, in, um, in the data lake. Okay? So I want to move on real quick to actual doing of the AI, the, the creating of the models. And these days, there's two types of AI. There's traditional AI, which was everything that we used to do before uh, OpenAI released ChatGPT. And then there's generative AI. And they put uh, the reason I break them out is they put a very different workload on your um, on your, uh, your your data uh, your AI data infrastructure. So real quick, let's go through what you can do uh, with traditional AI. Um, now, if you're if you're doing um, if you're using images, video, or audio, that's going to be in your data lake side of the of the data lake house. Okay. But if you're using um, structured data, if you have your uh, training sets and your test sets in structured data, like Avro files and Parquet, you got an option. You can either keep those right in your data lake, right in MinIO directly, and, and that's fine, perfectly fine. But if you think that that data could be used by other workloads, like business intelligence or data analytics, uh, consider putting it in your data lake house, where those... Um, those other workloads can use it. And if you do that, you, you can make use of what's known as uh, zero copy branching. And, and this is what um, 
This is what the LakeFS folks do for unstructured data, but it's a feature of all the open table formats. And it works just like Git. Let's say you want to do something pretty drastic to your, the, the, the structure of your, of your tables that's in the um, open table format data warehouse. You can just create your own branch and it uses dirty little tricks with the metadata to give you what appears to be your own copy of the database, but it's not. It's just keeping track of metadata changes. And you can do whatever you want on that branch and only you can see it. And if you get a result you like, you can check it back in and now it's available for everybody. If you accidentally screwed something up, you can roll it back. It's just like it, just like with your code. So like I said, this is kind of one of my favorite features of the open table formats. I think it could be really useful for doing uh, feature engineering when you try to change different, or try to change your features to get a better result for your model. All right, now generative AI, like I said, it puts a totally different workload on your uh, AI data infrastructure. Here's a hypothetical document pipeline. If you're trying to build up a vector database to do retrieval augmented generation, uh, but the bottom line here is you're going to want to use MinIO or the, or the data lake side of your data lake house. You're going to want to use that to store your documents that are going to be used for retrieval augmented generation in what's known as a custom corpus. And that's just, like I said, that's basically where you have gone through all your portals in your organization. You've located those documents that are relevant to the generative AI, generative AI model you want to build, and you kind of store them as is in MinIO. And then from there, you can build out your vector database, uh, chunk in those documents and, and chunk overlaps and all those different parameters to, to make your vector database useful. Okay, So that's how you um, build your document pipeline. Uh, in case you're... In case you're kind of a little fuzzy on what a vector database really is, it, it facilitates semantic search. So here's a search without a vector database. If you wanted to search for documents that mentioned artificial, artificial intelligence, you would have to know every synonym and every different abbreviation of the term you're searching for. Uh, and again, that's, that's um, going to be a slow running query and it's prone to error. A better thing to do is use a vector database. It's going to understand using dirty little tricks with vector mathematics that you, you know, you're just going to have to search for artificial intelligence. It's going to know all the terms that are related from that based on how you train the embeddings, you know, et cetera. Okay. And I'm not going to go through this, but this is how you put it all together. Um, this is kind of adapted from a white paper on Hugging Face, on Hugging Face site. But uh, again, I, won't, I don't have time to go through this here, but this is how you put it all together with your vector database, your, your inference, and it, hopefully it just works for you. And then, um, now the other thing you could do with uh, generative AI is you could, there's a lot of open source LLMs, so you, in case you don't want to build, them from, build your LLMs from scratch, um, you can fine tune them. So you have your custom corpus where you have all the documents that are related to the generative AI you want to build, you can fine tune a model. And if you want, you don't even have to do the uh, RAG workflow. But an interesting thing that I, I've seen some companies do is they will prototype with open, with open AIs, um, with ChatGPT, with the APIs. They'll, do, they'll prototype with retrieval augmented generation and then when they get something that is uh, viable, uh, they'll, you know, they get a project okayed, they'll want a model that they can run cheaper than OpenAI in the cloud. So they'll get a smaller model, uh, fine tune it with their custom corpus, and then take that model and also use retrieval augmented generation. So it's kind of like a, uh, kind of like a nice little trick to educate a smaller, uh, cheaper model to run on your custom data, on your custom corpus, and then at the same time use retrieval augmented generation to uh, get the model right on top of a question that's being answered and to help eliminate uh, hallucinations. Okay, um, this is the, this was actually a fun project I did at uh, MinIO. I gave myself this uh, challenge. I wanted to see if I could use MinIO uh, to host a data set that could not fit in memory. Um, not, not only could it not fit in memory, but I had to go retrieve the data when I was looping through the batches of every epoch during training. Okay? So what I did is I, I kind of set this, set this up, and I used the Ray framework. 
Um, oh, in, in addition to that, I wanted to, um, I wanted to checkpoint after every epic, and I wanted to track all my metrics after every epic using ML flow. So I set this, oh, oh and one more challenge. I also had some pre-processing to do, which I wanted to do in a distributed fashion. So I wanted to do distributed training, distributed pre-processing, and I wanted to do it in a cluster, and I wanted to track it in ML flow with the data coming from MinIO. So I put all this together, and I wrote about it in a blog post, which you know, if you, you search our, um, send me an email or search our site, it's, you'll, you'll find it. But again, I wanted to prove myself that distributed training really works. It does, it does cut down quite a bit on training time. And so much so that I, it's kind of my recommendation that you get distributed training working before you even consider buying a GPU. Because that's, um, you know, chances are you, you, may, you may, if you're just doing traditional AI, or maybe you're not putting a heavy workload on your generative AI, this may be good enough, and you could save a lot of money. So, uh, kind of final topic. I want to kind of show you what's going on with, um, with GPUs. So here's a, a list of all the GPUs on the market today. And it's, it's kind of interesting. It, it, if you look at the, just the, re, these are the release dates. If you look at the release date, it looks like we kind of, and, look, and let's just look at the first version of a new architecture. So every time NVIDIA uh, changes architecture, they name it after a mathematician. So we've, we have Ampere, uh, Grace Hopper, and Blackwell. That's the A, H, and B. And if we look at just the 100 versions, we can see that there's kind of like a Moore's Law thing going on. It looks like maybe every two years we get close to twice as fast. So that's, so that's kind of interesting. Um, the other thing you'll notice, too, is the memory is greatly increasing. So if you've worked with, uh, I do a lot of experiments on my gaming laptop, and the small memory of the GPU kind of dictates my batch size. So I find myself doing a lot of batches within each epic. But you can see that with some of these newer uh, GPUs, you're probably going to have pretty good sized batches. Okay, so you're going to be batching through your epics, um, you know, quite quickly. And it's kind of interesting too because when I gave this talk uh, three months ago, I did not have the Blackwell chips, the, the last two at the bottom. I had, uh, and I was able to do this, put this slide in terms of teraflops. But when I included the Blackwell chips, I had to beef it up to uh, petaflops. And just, to, just for fun, to give you an idea of what a, what a flop is. So a flop is a, how many floating point operations can happen in one second. So if you write it all out, uh, you, know, you can see this is what a petaflop is. It's one with 15 zeros. And you can see the B200 can do, you know, 4.5, I mean, you can see the number for yourself. That's how many floating point operations happen in one second. So just look at your watch, watch one second tick off, and that's how many operations like the Blackwell can do. That's, that is crazy. When you, when you think about that, now when I think about that in terms of what that means for uh, a machine learning pipeline, uh, I think of the starving GPU problem. Okay, and, and I had to, when I was trying to think of a good graphic for the starving GPU problem, the only thing I could think of was the cookie monster, so I'm kind of dating myself a little bit, but it's like my favorite Sesame Street character. But what the starving GPU problem is, it's when you have, uh, a, you know, we have a pipeline list where, which involves storage, network, and GPU, and the GPU is the fastest thing in, in, your, in your pipeline. Yep. Yeah. Okay? And that's not what you want because the GPU is the most expensive. If you look at some of the price tags that uh, uh, NVIDIA is putting on their, on their chips, if you look at some of the price tags NVIDIA's put on our chips, some of the, some of the, cheap, some of the uh, super chips cost as much as a house. So in that situation, when you have uh, you know, a system like this, you want your most expensive resource to be the most utilized. So, uh, so uh, you want to definitely have a high-speed network. Uh, and up to three months ago, we would, 
at MinIO, we were recommending people go to a 100 gigabyte network. Uh, I recently saw a presentation from uh, Supermicro. They're actually recommending 200 gigabyte uh, networks based on some of the experiments they're doing with GPUs and storage. And, and that, so let's say you have, uh, you have these fast GPUs. Let's say you have a fast network. You also got to make sure that your storage can cough up that data really quick. R remember my little experiment where I did distributed training, where I kind of wanted to challenge myself. I had a data set that just couldn't fit into memory, much like what you'd have if you're training an LLM. Well, if, you're, if you have to go get your data for every uh, batch of every epic, you're going to want your storage system to be really, really fast. So, I mean, I, we've, we've thought a lot about that. Like I said, we call this a starving GPU problem. And our enterprise feature, our, our new enterprise suite, which we launched three, three months ago, has something known as a cache. And it just works. It's not like a, a normal cache where when you're writing your code, you ask the cache for a piece of data. If it doesn't have it, you go back and get it yourself, and then you put it in for the next requester. If you turn on min cache for a bucket, we'll take care of managing the cache for you. If you request an object from that bucket, we'll first look at the cache. If it's not there, we'll put it in the cache for you for subsequent requests. So um, using the min cache, you could uh, greatly speed up uh, the, the data access of, of your, your training set. And what we've done, the, the reason we did this is we've noticed that when customers, they deploy MinIO to a, maybe a cluster, a lot of those servers have a lot of DRAM that's just not used. So what, uh, what we've done with um, MinCache is we've let you pull that, all that memory together, and we use it for the cache, so the, the data is coming from uh, the DRAM. And we locate the objects in such a way, it's, it's known as a consistent cache, where we have kind of a fancy algorithm to figure out which node to put each object on. And we, we, we spread out the cached objects in such a way that if you, if you lose a node, it is minimal effort to recreate that node with the, with the objects that were cached in it. So um, it, it's, um, it takes advantage of unused DRAM, and it has uh, pretty fancy uh, heuristics for, for spreading out your objects over the various servers. All right, I think... I just had my fun slide here, so I, I told you. This is my last slide, and it's actually kind of fun. So I, it turns out the science community is well ahead of us in terms of picking prefixes that we can use to denote flops. Like I said, uh, three months ago, I was talking in terms of teraflops. Today, I'm talking to you in terms of petaflops. And when I read some of these prefixes, I got to tell you that my favorite one is that one, Yoda flops. Maybe it's because I'm like a, a Star Wars fan, but... It's kind of my goal to be in this job when MinIO can support Yoda bytes. And I can tell you that GPUs are running on Yoda flops. So looks like I'm right on time. Um, oh, wait. I talked really quick. I covered a lot of stuff in just a short amount of time. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them now. Any of the content that I talked about, if you send me an email, I'll send you links to all the content I referenced. But uh, thanks for your time, and any questions? Hi. Cloud agnostic platform. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I'm leaning towards Databricks right now, but right. that be the platform that you'd recommend as well. Mm -hmm. um, these are the two questions I sent. Okay, right. so so you use an ML ops tool and, and the name of it again? Uh, I used uh, AWS SageMaker that supports SageMaker is AWS's native mm -hmm. uh, sort of ML tooling. Right. Which supports quite a lot of the functionality you mentioned. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask your opinion on that. And the second part was if for now we are looking to build a sort of uh, cloud provider agnostic MLOps right. platform, right. which one would you recommend? You went through three of them. Kubeflow went into CNCF. Right. That'd be the 
one that you would go with right. or Databricks? Um, you know, they're all, they're all, all three of them are, are cloud agnostic. You know, like Kubeflow runs on Kubernetes. Um, ML run you can install any uh, ML flow you can install anywhere because it's all based on open source stuff, including Minio and, and, and ML run uh, the same exact, exact thing. So I I don't think I would base. I, I think you're good there. What I recommend when people choose the ML ops platform, I kind of recommend that they look at those ten features and figure out which one they need, as opposed to trying to figure trying to you know match the the platform that r they're running on because because all the tools I presented are, are cloud native. Okay, um, and, and to give an example, sometimes people don't need some of the packaging and deployment options because they figured that out already. It's really not that hard. You know, a trained model is nothing more than an object. So, um, I hope that's a good answer to your question. But I, I think that all, you know, all the tools I presented are cloud native. They can run in, in any cloud, and they can run on premise. Uh, base your decision off the features. In, in that other tool that you mentioned, I'm not familiar with it. If you talk to me afterwards. Uh, maybe I'll add it to my repertoire of things that I, I research. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.